everyone and welcome back to the Retro Channel. Today we're doing a bit more in-depth look at Commodore 64 troubleshooting. So last time I looked at basic troubleshooting with just a multimeter and we did get lucky and managed to actually fix a C64 with fairly minimal effort and minimal tools but that's not always the case and last time we ended uh, with this short board which did have a dodgy switch, seems to be fairly common, um, but even after fixing that, it still doesn't work. So we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, first, I wanna go through the diagnostic and dead test cartridge. Now, usually you can find these on eBay or online anywhere, and they're fairly inexpensive. I mean, you'd probably expect to pay around maybe $30 for one of these. And optionally, you can get the diagnostic test harness. If you're just fixing a single Commodore 64, it's probably not worth investing in the harness. But if you're planning on fixing multiples, then definitely the harness is the way to go. This particular one is sort of a Frankenstein because I previously purchased one that I wasn't really happy with and I went and ordered the PCVs that Sven Peterson um, designed and then just wired this all up um, and it is quite dodgy. There's actual spots for connectors here and I just stuck wires in there because it's just me using this so I'm not really concerned about the looks of it. That's another story. Let's first start out with my test board. Um, so you can see it's got uh, quite a few ZIF sockets just so it's nice and easy to pop chips in and out. Um, makes it very simple to test. Um, chips from other machines uh, back and forth. Now when I went to start filming this video this actually stopped working and I'll give you a demonstration. So there's nothing on the display at the moment. Uh, it's gonna pop up with no signal. And if I power this on, we still just have no signal. So I actually worried that the Vic chip was dead, which would be a shame because they're pretty hard to come by. So they're, they're quite expensive. Uh, but as it turns out, it's actually the clock generator chip, which is this one just here, the 8701, which happens to be a Moss branded chip. And as I'm touching it right now, it is trying to melt my finger off. So it's got an internal short somewhere and that's got to come out. So this board was working just fine previously. Um, but as usual, another dead moss chip um, isn't a surprise. So I borrowed another 8701, which I'll stick in here for now, but I have ordered some modern replacements from Jeff Burt, whose channel you can check out. He came up with a design that's in quite a small footprint, um, but using modern components. So they'll be on their way eventually, but um, yeah, until then I'm just gonna borrow one from a different board. So ideally we should get our basic screen. So, we won't look at the diagnostic harness just yet. We'll start with the dead test, just so I can give you an example of what it normally looks like. And then we'll play around with some of these chips and show you an example of what it shouldn't look like. Now the dead test always takes about maybe 15, 20 seconds to come up in with anything on the screen. There we go. So um, when you first power it on and you get a black screen, just give it a little bit of time because it does take a bit of time just to test basic RAM functions before you actually get a screen. So this will run through. It takes about a minute. Um, does various different tests um, with some of the, the lower memory, also the screen RAM, color RAM, and you can see there's a little flickering character going through as it tests the screen RAM does a similar thing when it tests the color RAM. So you, you can see a faint sort of colored cursor that runs through the screen quite quickly. Down here, we've got two timers. Uh, at the moment, they're both showing 
36 AM and 36 PM. These come from the CIA chips. And if one of them's not functional, those two timers will become out of sync. Sometimes they'll just display garbage. This blank screen is also normal. Um, it will return. So if you see the screen, all the characters on the screen disappearing like that, just give it a bit of time, about 20 seconds, it'll come back. Uh, it's just doing other tests where it has to blank the screen basically. And then at the end you get a SID test. Um, it's pretty basic. It just runs through the voices on the SID. Um, so there can still be issues with the SID chip even if it sounds okay in the dead test. As you can see our timers are still synced up. So one of them has the same time AM, the other one has the same time PM. And that relates to CIA1 and CIA2. After that, it just goes through the test again and the count will just increment after every test. Now, let's put in a known non-working chip. Let's say we'll take out the second CIA, which is in U2, and I'll put a bad one in. So this one was having issues. I don't remember what it was, but there's a good chance that we'll be able to see from the dead test if it's not working. So everything pops up. It takes, it has to do a couple of tests first before you get to see those timers. So test zero page and stack page. And then the timer should pop up and we can see one of them says 11 AM. The second one says 00, 00 PM. So that's U1. That's U2, and our bad chip is in U2. This isn't a definitive test. There can be other things wrong with the CIA chips, and the timers can still function. So depending on what's wrong with them, but that's that's a an easy way to tell that there's an issue with the CIA chip, and this one's just stuck at zero. Likewise, if we pull it out, it'll, it'll behave the same way. So it's, this chip may as well not have even been in there. Um, and same applies with the CIA chip in U1. So there we go, 11 AM. This actually says 60 000 AM. So it's still wrong. If we put the working one in, everything goes back to normal. Now the dead test won't tell you everything and it doesn't fully test the RAM, um, but generally it'll find a fault if there is one with a RAM chip. So I'm going to remove the RAM in U21 and I'll put in one that I know doesn't work. Power on. And if it detects a RAM issue, you'll get flashes straight away. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, depending on how many flashes you get on the screen, will point you to which RAM chip it suspects is faulty. This again, isn't always correct. Sometimes it could be a bad PLA and because it's not addressing other things on the board properly, it will suspect a RAM chip, which actually may not have an issue. Um, I think if we power it up without that chip, it'll still give us those eight flashes. Yes. Um, there can be times where you'll have a bad RAM chip. I think this is the one. Yeah. So this is a bad RAM chip, but we're not getting any flashes. So, and here's our dead test. And you can see the screen is all screwed up. So you're not always gonna get flashes when you have a faulty RAM chip. Sometimes you'll actually make it into the dead test. So it obviously hasn't detected that it's bad until it's made it this far. And you can almost make out that it's trying to say zero page is bad. And I think it's just stuck there. So those kind of things can happen as well. 
The other thing you can do with the RAM chips uh, is called piggybacking, where if you suspect there's a faulty RAM chip on the board and you don't want to take it out, um, you can sandwich a known working RAM chip on top of it. So making sure the legs actually um, all connect to each other. And sometimes that'll be enough to actually boot into the system. Other times it'll just give you a different result. But at least if you notice that there's a change when you piggyback a suspect RAM chip, that may be enough to, to, to clue you in on which RAM chip is, is having issues. This one does not want to sit on top of the other one. We can see now that the dead test has come up. Now that bad RAM chip that we had is still in that socket, but I've got a good RAM chip piggybacked on top of it. I'm just holding it on because it wants to escape. So in theory, as soon as I take that off, it's bad. So that can be a way of testing RAM while it's still soldered onto the board, but it's not always foolproof. Let's move on to say, if we've got a bad VIC chip. Now, usually this is pretty obvious because you're either gonna get, you're either gonna have no signal at all, so you won't even get a black screen, or you're gonna have something like this. So as you can see, this is not what the dead test is supposed to look like. We're still supposed to have a black screen at this point. And this cartridge actually has a little reset button. And I can see that when I hit the reset button, this pattern on the screen actually changes slightly. So I can tell that CPU is being reset. So in theory, that part's working, but the VIC is just, it's holding up the rest of the system and it's not outputting what we want to see. So that's what we get in dead tests. So a, a video display issue like that um, likely points to the VIC. Thankfully, they're always socketed. So as long as you can get your hands on another one, um, it's pretty easy to rule that out. CPU is hard to tell if you've got a bad one of those without putting it on a scope. We're not going to bust out the scope just yet. Um, sort of want to take it one step at a time. Because this CPU is bad, I don't even think we're going to make it into the dead test because it, it's not able to address anything. Yeah, we've just got black screen. Sometimes you can have a bad CPU and it'll still boot, but it'll cause other issues. Maybe it won't be able to talk to some of the other, um, like the peripheral CIA chips. The PLA can be a tricky one. So if you've got a faulty PLA, usually you're gonna get a black screen, uh, even on the dead test. In this case, I think this PLA is just gonna stop everything from working. Yeah, we're not even getting into the dead test. Now, because the dead test runs in what's called Ultimax mode, which actually emulates a the Commodore Max machine, which I think was only available in Japan. Uh, it was like a really stripped down cross between a Commodore 64 and a VIC-20. It had like a rubber membrane keyboard. So it was pretty crap, almost, you know, like a ZX Spectrum. Because it emulates that machine and that machine did not come with a basic ROM didn't come with a character ROM and it didn't come with a kernel ROM. They were all just stored within the cartridge that you plugged into that machine. The dead test doesn't actually know to address those anyway. Because it's emulating that machine, it's not aware of those ROM chips. So you can actually remove them. Um, you can even, of course, remove the SID. The CIAs you can also remove, you'll just see those timers will be messed up and out of sync, but you can remove potentially six chips from one of these boards and still boot the dead test just fine. That's an option, especially if they're in sockets. So the three ROM chips, which 
sit here between the two CIAs and the CPU. And your SID chip, which will either be up here or down here, depending on which board revision, you can still get straight into the dead test because it's not actually looking for these chips anyway. Although it is looking for the CIA chips, um, it's not required to have those in either. So that's another option because potentially if one of these chips is causing an issue, let's say it's, it's holding up the bus or maybe it's got an internal short, that could stop the whole machine from booting and simply just removing this one of these chips um, can allow the machine to boot again. I think that's about all I can show you with the dead test. So let's move over to the diagnostic test. I'm not gonna hook up the harness yet. Um, we'll just give you an idea of what the diagnostic test looks like without a harness. And it helps if you put the character ROM and the basic ROM in their right positions. All right, so here's the standard diagnostic test. Um, it does a similar thing to the dead test, so it checks zero page and stack page, although it does it a lot quicker. You've got the two timers here, so you can tell uh, the timers are functioning correctly. It does a bit more extensive RAM tests, and it also tests these ROMs. So you do actually have to have uh, basic kernel and character in order to pass these tests. Now you'll see that cassette, control port, serial port, user port, U1, U2, and the SID are labeled as bad, and they will always be labeled bad if you don't have the full harness connected. These ports rely on the two CIA chips, and the SID chip relies on feedback from the controller port for the paddle inputs, so those analog usually rotating knob joystick things, if you can call them that. We can see that everything else looks okay. It's only these ports that are labeled as bad because we don't have the harness connected. So if you don't opt for a harness, you're just gonna have to manually work out if everything works. Um, that can be a little bit tricky because you sort of need to confirm the user port works and the tape port works and the serial and the paddle inputs for the joysticks. So it's up to you. You can always start off with the dead test and diagnostic and build your own harness. Now let's have another look at, let's say we'll remove the basic ROM and you can see what that looks like. Exactly the same. Because it's not booting into basic, um, it doesn't care less if the basic ROM is not installed. If we were to remove, say, the character ROM, it doesn't know how to generate characters. So you get this mess of a screen, but you can still see that there's a red box here. So it can draw the right colors, um, but it just can't generate the characters. Removing the kernel ROM if I can do this by lifting it by its heatsink. Black screen. So you cannot boot the diagnostic without at least the kernel. Again, we can still remove the CIA chips and the diagnostic will boot, but straight away we can see this one says 0, 20, 00, so the timers are wrong and It'll obviously fail the, um, the port tests if you've got the harness connected. Uh, again, you don't need the SID chip for the diagnostic test. And the only other thing that we can really demonstrate simply is the color RAM, which will be labeled 2114. So if we boot without the color RAM, the screen is multicolored because it's trying to it's trying to set the color in the color RAM and then it's trying to read back from it and it's not getting anything so it's constantly just flashing through colors. Likewise if we've got a faulty color RAM it will do something similar. Let's see. This one has set all the characters to gray. 
interesting. There's one more here. Let's just throw it in just for fun. And that's a different set of colors, mostly pink and gray. So yeah, you can run it without the color RAM and it'll look like this. And if you've got a faulty color RAM, chances are it's gonna look like some other kind of messed up color. We'll just have a quick look at the diagnostic harness and then we'll get on to see if we can repair this other Commodore 64 using the dead test and diagnostic. There's a loopback connector that goes into the serial port, doesn't connect to anything else. And all the other cables are actually tied to the user port. So there's one for the user port, cassette port, port two of the joysticks and port one. There is also one for the keyboard connector. You can leave this off. Um, in fact, let's demonstrate that first. So everything's come up as okay. The keyboard has come up as open because we don't have a keyboard loop back attached. Um, but yeah, no bad chips, no bads up here. So that's what the harness should look like. If you do get something reported as bad, it could just be that you need to clean the actual contacts on one of these ports. Uh, you might have a broken wire, especially in the case that I've done here where I've just soldered them straight onto the board. Um, or it could be a fault um, on the main board itself, especially if it's being reported by a particular chip. With the keyboard loop back connected, um, we'll see that when it gets to the keyboard test, it'll report okay. So it's not 100% necessary to have the keyboard uh, loop back connected, but if you've got the machine open, you may as well. So you can see keyboards reported okay, along with everything else. And if, for example, we didn't have a working SID, then it will report that the joystick port is bad. So you can see everything else is okay, but it's saying control port is bad and U18 is bad because it needs the SID chip to determine if those uh, analog inputs on the joystick port are working. Likewise, if I had have unplugged one of these, it would report that the joystick port's bad and the SID's bad, even though the SID works just fine. It's just that it's not getting that feedback from the joystick port. I think that is about all I can show with the dead test and diagnostic. So, Let's see if we can use it to fix this other board. Nothing else connected. We're just gonna power it on, see what it does. And yep, we're still getting a black screen. And actually, turn the volume up on this. So before it had a bad switch, which wasn't switching the AC input correctly and I did mention you can spray isopropyl alcohol in it and that may clear it up, but it's recommended to pull it off the board. If we listen, if I just touch the switch, so as I'm sort of pushing on the switch, I can actually hear interference with the audio. It's still switched on and I'm just sort of lightly pressing on the switch. The isopropyl alcohol cleared it out enough for it to switch correctly, it's still not a great contact. So the first thing I'm gonna do before I even start trying to diagnose what's wrong with this board is just to remove this switch, which is connected by these two solder points, which hold the case, and then these six pins, which are actually the pins going to the switch. So I'm gonna remove that first, just so we can open it up, clean it out properly. And to do that, you're obviously gonna need a soldering iron. And if you have access to one, a desoldering gun always helps. If not, you might be stuck with the old manual solder pump and desoldering wick. Okay, now unfortunately I didn't save the footage of the switch repair. Um, but I have shown that in a previous video. I think it's part two of the repair-a-thon. So you can check that out if you're interested to see 
uh, what it looks like uh, somewhere around here. This is the Q-tip um, that I cleaned it up with and yeah, it's filthy. One more thing I wanted to show that could have been in part one of this series is checking voltages from the cassette port. Now I've got the harness plugged in, um, which is handy because Sven's put little lights for the motor and sense uh, signals. But if you power the board on, usually these two will illuminate, so it'll send voltage through the motor and sense signals. That's controlled by the CPU. So when you first power it on, they'll turn on. They'll pretty much turn off straight away as soon as the CPU gets reset. And then if you've got the dead test going, uh, the sense light or sense signal will receive about 4.4 volts uh, once the dead test actually starts. So that's a good way of just testing if the CPU is functioning and potentially the VIC and PLA. If they're not functioning, for example, if we pop this working CPU out and put in one that definitely doesn't work. You can see that the voltage is only 2.6 volts and these lights are not turning off. So the system's currently stuck. It's not even uh, making it to that reset phase. Now, what's interesting is if we pop in uh, this VIC that I showed before that has the red color output, it actually gets far enough to almost reset the CPU. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Let's try it one more time. So even though the VIC doesn't work properly, it's still at least giving the CPU a clock signal and potentially some other things just enough to get those motor and sense signals to turn off. Right, so with the short board, because I don't have another short board that I can swap a working VIC from, um, we can at least test to see what those signals do here. So you can see that they get stuck on and that's with the dead test inserted. So, and hitting the reset on the dead test does nothing. So I originally suspected the VIC, but it could actually be an issue with the CPU. Now, ideally with the shortboard CPU, uh, the reset pretty much triggers almost instantly. So with the long board, there's about half a second delay for the reset line for to go from low to high. With the short board, they sort of eliminated that delay. So these things actually power on a little bit faster and you may even notice it if you were comparing a short board with a long board. So if this thing was working correctly, we'd expect to see those lights power off almost instantly as soon as we flick the, the power switch, but yeah they're being stuck on. So I think it's going to be the CPU. One more thing that I don't think I've actually done with this board is given it a close inspection, which is always a good idea. Let's get rid of this sticker, which isn't going to come off nicely. I don't think there's any damage under there. You wouldn't expect anything. Let's see what else we've got there. Everything looks pretty normal except for U18, this 4066. Now I think this controls the, the pot inputs from the joystick ports. I think it's like a comparator or a, a multiplexer or something. So I wouldn't expect that to hold the system up. Um, oh yeah, and we can definitely see on the underside of the board, there's been some work done to it and they, those solder joints are pretty terrible. Doesn't look like there was enough heat applied at the time. So they're all sort of stringy. The solder hasn't melted properly. Apart from that, the rest of the board looks pretty normal. Um, you'll notice that there's flux around the, the connectors. That's because they're just, they're soldered in the factory after everything else gets 
goes through the wave flow soldering. These are sort of hand soldered. So nothing unusual there. This looks like the only odd one out. Maybe some work's been done to the super PLA. You can see a little bit of flux residue around there, but, and some of the joints are shinier than the others. But yeah, I'll definitely reflow this 4066 just to make sure that's not causing an issue. But you know, like I said, I think it's gonna be the CPU. Hmm. One of the legs actually doesn't seem to be coming through the other side of the board. I don't know if you'll be able to see that in the camera, but this last leg is actually bent under the chip. So it's not even coming all the way through. I don't know if it's, if it's making contact. So I'm just going to add some fresh solder and then I'll desolder this chip and throw a socket in instead, just in case. <laughs> oh, it's a mess. So yeah, that leg was bent in. We're missing a leg over here. Um, I have to see if I've got a spare. Otherwise, we'll tack a new leg on there and see if it if it works. But whoever did this didn't do a very good job. Let's say that. All right, replacement four hundred six six is in. The switch has been fixed up, even though that really only affects the SID at this point. Um, let's see if this will power on. I'm not holding out much hope. I really do think that it's likely to be a CPU issue, but it's worth a shot. Yeah, we've still got that same behavior on the cassette port. So things are locked up. And at this point, I just replace the CPU. You can put uh, a longboard CPU, so one of the 6510s in here, and it should work just fine. But because this is a troubleshooting series, uh, we'll move into part three, where we look at everything on an oscilloscope, and we can compare results again from a working board and a non-working board. So stick around for part three, which will already be available to my Patreons. And until next time, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and See you later.